Good morning. We're going to continue with part three continued. How to break the worry habit. Chapter nine. Cooperate with the inevitable. When I was a little boy, I was playing with some of my friends in the attic of an old abandoned log house in Northwest Missouri. As I climbed down out of the attic, I rested my feet on a window sill for a moment and then jumped. I had a ring on my left forefinger and as I jumped, the ring caught on a nail head and tore off my finger. I screamed, I was terrified, I was positive I was going to die. But after the hand healed, I never worried about it for one split second. What would have been the use? I accepted the inevitable. Now, I often go for a month at a time without even thinking about the fact that I have only three fingers and a thumb on my left hand. A few years ago, I met a man who was running a freight elevator in one of the downtown office buildings in New York. I noticed that his left hand had been cut off at the wrist. I asked him if the loss of that hand bothered him. He said, oh no, I hardly ever think about it. I'm not married and the only time I ever think about it is when I try to thread a needle. It is astonishing how quickly we can accept almost any situation if we have to and adjust ourselves to it and then forget about it. I often think of an inscription on the ruins of a 15th century cathedral in Amsterdam, Holland. This inscription says in Flemish, it is so, it cannot be otherwise. As you and I march across the decades of time, we are going to meet a lot of unpleasant situations that are so. They cannot be otherwise. We have our choice. We can either accept them as inevitable and adjust ourselves to them, or we can ruin our lives with rebellion and maybe end up with a nervous breakdown. Here is a bit of sage advice from one of my favorite philosophers, William James. The quote is, be willing to have it so. Acceptance of what has happened is the first step to overcoming the consequences of any misfortune. Elizabeth Conley of 2840 Northeast 49th Avenue from Portland, Oregon had to find that out the hard way. Here is a letter that she wrote me recently. On the very day that America, excuse me, was celebrating the victory of our armed forces in North Africa, the letter says, I received a telegram from the War Department. My nephew, the person I loved most, was missing in action. A short time later, another telegram arrived saying he was dead. I was prostrate with grief. Up to that time, I had felt that life had been very good to me. I had a job I loved. I had helped to raise this nephew. He represented to me all that was fine and good in young manhood. I had felt that all the bread I had cast upon the waters was coming back to me as cake. Then came this telegram. My entire world collapsed. I felt there was nothing left to live for. I neglected my work, neglected my friends. I let everything go. I was bitter and resentful. Why did my loving nephew have to be taken? 
Why did this good boy, with life all before him, why did he have to be killed? I couldn't accept it. My grief was so, so overwhelming that I decided to give up my work and go away and hide myself in my tears and bitterness. I was clearly, I was clearing out my desk, getting ready to quit when I came across a letter that I had forgotten. A letter from this nephew who had been killed. A letter he had written to me when my mother had died a few years ago. Of course we will miss her, the letter said, and especially you, but I know you'll carry on. Your own personal philosophy will make you do that. I shall never forget the beautiful truths you taught me. Wherever I am, or how far apart we may be, I shall always remember that you taught me to smile and to take whatever comes like a man. I read and reread that letter. It seemed as if he were there beside me, speaking to me. He seemed to be saying to me, why don't you do what you taught me to do? Carry on no matter what happens. Hide your private sorrows under a smile and carry on. So I went back to my work. I stopped being bitter and rebellious. I kept saying to myself, it is done. I can't change it, but I can and will carry on as he wished me to do. I threw all my mind and strength into my work. I wrote letters to soldiers, to other people's boys. I joined an adult education class at night, seeking out new interests and making new friends. I can hardly believe the change that has come over me. I have ceased mourning over the past that is forever gone. I am living each day now with joy, just as my nephew would have wanted me to. I have made peace with life. I have accepted my fate. I am now living a fuller and more complete life than I have ever known. Elizabeth Conley out in Portland, Oregon, learned what all of us will have to learn sooner or later, namely that we must accept and cooperate with the inevitable. It is so, it cannot be otherwise. That is not an easy lesson to learn. Even kings on their thrones have to keep reminding themselves of it. The late George V had these framed words hanging on the wall of his library in Buckingham Palace. Last sunrise this morning. <clears throat> excuse me. Teach. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Teach me neither to cry for the moon nor over spilt milk. The same thought is expressed by Schopenhauer in this way. A good supply of resignation is of the first importance in providing for the journey of life. Obviously, circumstances alone do not make us happy or unhappy. It is the way we react to circumstances that determines our feelings. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is within you. That is where the kingdom of hell is, too. We can all endure disaster and tragedy and triumph over them if we have to. We may not think we can. <clears throat> Excuse me. We may not think we can, but we have surprisingly strong inner resources that will see us through if we will only make use of them. We are stronger than we think. The late Booth Tarkington always said, I could take anything that life could force upon me except one thing, blindness. 
I could never endure that. Then one day, when he was uh, long in his 60s, Tarkington glanced down at the carpet on the floor. The colors were blurred. He couldn't see the pattern. He went to a specialist. He learned the tragic truth. He was losing his sight. One eye was nearly blind. The other would follow. That which he feared most had come upon him. And now, how did Tarkington react to this worst of all disasters? Did he feel, this is it, this is the end of my life? No, to his amazement, he felt quite gay. He even called upon his humor. Floating specks annoyed him. They would swim across his eyes and cut off his vision. Yet when the largest of these specks would swim across his sight, he would say, hello, there's grandfather again. Wonder where he's going on this fine morning. How could fate ever conquer a spirit like that? The answer is it couldn't. When total darkness closed in, Darkington said, I found I could take the loss of my eyesight just as a man can take anything else. If I lost all five of my senses, I know I could live on inside my mind, for it is in the mind we see, and in the mind we live, whether we know it or not. In the hope of restoring his eyesight, Tarkington had to go through more than 12 operations within one year with local anesthetic. Did he rail against this? He knew it had to be done. He knew he couldn't escape it. So the only way to lessen his suffering was to take it with grace. He refused a private room at the hospital and went into a ward where he could be with other people who had troubles too. He tried to cheer them up and when he had to submit to repeated operations, fully conscious of what was being done to his eyes, he tried to remember how fortunate he was. How wonderful, he said. How wonderful the science now has the skill to operate on anything so delicate as the human eye. The average man would have been a nervous wreck if he had to endure more than 12 operations and blindness. Yet Tarkington said, I would not exchange this experience for a happier one. It taught him acceptance. It taught him that nothing life could bring him was beyond his strength to endure. It taught him, as John Milton discovered, that it is not miserable to be blind it is only miserable not to be able to endure blindness. Margaret Fuller, the famous New England feminist, once offered her as her credo, I accept the universe. When grouchy old Thomas Carlyle heard that in England, he snorted, by God, she better Yes, and by gad, you and I had better accept the inevitable, too. If we rail and kick against it and grow bitter, we won't change the inevitable, but we will change ourselves. I know, I have tried it. I once refused to accept an inevitable situation with which I was confronted. I played the fool and railed against it and rebelled. I turned my nights into hells of insomnia. I brought upon myself everything I didn't want. Finally, after a year of self-torture, I had to accept that what I knew from the outset I couldn't possibly alter. I should have cried out years ago with old Walt Whitman. 
O to confront night, storms, hunger, ridicule, accident, rebuffs, as the trees and animals do. I spent 12 years working with cattle, yet I never saw a Jersey cow running at temperature because the pasture was burning up from a lack of rain or because of sleet and cold or because her boyfriend was paying too much attention to another heifer. The animals confront night, storms, and hunger calmly so they never have nervous breakdowns or stomach ulcers and they never go insane. drink there. Am I advocating that we simply bow down to all the adversities that come our way? Not by a long shot. That is mere fatalism. As long as there is a chance that we can save a situation, let's fight. But when common sense tells us that we are up against something that is so and cannot be otherwise, then in the name of our sanity, let's not look before and after and pine for what is not. The late Dean Hawks of Columbia University told me that he had taken a mother goose rhyme as one of his mottos. For every ailment under the sun, there is a remedy or there is none. If there be one, try to find it. If there be none, never mind it. While writing this book, I interviewed a number of the leading businessmen of America, and I was impressed by the fact that they cooperated with the inevitable and led lives singularly free from worry. If they hadn't done that, they would have cracked under the strain. Here are a few examples of what I mean. J.C. Penney, founder of the nationwide chain of Penny stores, said to me, I wouldn't worry if I lost every dollar I have because I don't see what is to be gained by worrying. I do the best job I possibly can and leave the results in the laps of the gods. Henry Ford told me much the same thing. When I can't handle events, he said, I let them handle themselves. When I asked K.T. Keller, president of the Chrysler Corporation, how he kept from worrying, he replied, when I am up against a tough situation, if I can do anything about it, I do it. If I can't, I just forget it. I never worry about the future because I know no man living can possibly figure out what is going to happen in the future. There are so many forces that will affect that future. Nobody can tell what prompts those forces or understand them. So why worry about them? KT Keller would be embarrassed if you told him he is a philosopher. He is just a good businessman. Yet he has stumbled on the same philosophy that Epictetus taught in Rome 19th centuries ago. There is only one way to happiness, he taught the Romans, and that is to cease worrying about things which are beyond the power of our will. Sarah Bernhardt, the divine Sarah, was an illustrious example of a woman who knew how to cooperate with the inevitable. For half a century, she had been the reigning queen of the theater on four continents, the best loved actress on earth. Then when she was 71 and broke, she had lost all her money. Her physician, Professor Palsy of Paris, told her he would have to amputate her leg. While crossing the Atlantic, she had fallen on deck during a storm 
and injured her leg severely. Phlebitis developed. Her leg shrank. The pain became so intense that the doctor felt her leg had to be amputated. He was almost afraid to tell the stormy, tempestuous, divine Sarah what had to be done. He fully expected that the terrible news would set off an explosion of hysteria. But he was wrong. Sarah looked at him a moment and then said quietly, If it has to be, it has to be. It was fate. As she was being wheeled away to the operating room, her son stood weeping. She waved to him with a gay gesture and said cheerfully, Don't go away. I'll be right back. On the way to the operating room, she recited a scene from one of her plays. Someone asked her if she was doing this to cheer herself up. She said, No, to cheer up the doctors and nurses. It will be a strain on them. After recovering from the operation, Sarah Bernhardt went on touring the world and enchanting audiences for another seven years. When we stop fighting the inevitable, said Elise McCormick in a Reader's Digest article, we release energy which enables us to create a richer life. No one living has enough emotion and vigor to fight the inevitable, and at the same time, enough left over to create a new life. Choose one or the other. You can either bend with the inevitable sleet storms of life, or you can resist them and break. Uh, oh, we're almost done. I saw that happen on a farm I own in Missouri. I planted a score of trees on that farm. At first, they grew with astonishing quickness. Then, a sleet storm encrusted each twig and branch with a heavy coating of ice. Instead of bowing gracefully to their burden, these trees proudly resisted and broke and split under the load and had to be destroyed. They hadn't learned the wisdom of the forest of the north. I have traveled hundreds of miles through the evergreen forests of Canada, yet I have never seen a spruce or a pine broken by sleet or ice. These evergreen forests know how to bend, how to bow down their branches, how to cooperate with the inevitable. The masters of jiu-jitsu teach their pupils to bend like the willow, don't resist like the oak. Why do you think your automobile tires stand up on the road and take so much punishment? At first, the tire manufacturers tried to make a tire that would resist the shocks of the road. It was soon cut to ribbons. Then they made a tire that would absorb the shocks of the road. That tire could take it. You and I will last longer and enjoy smoother riding if we learn to absorb the shocks and jolts along the rocky road of life. What will happen to you and me if we resist the shocks of life instead of absorbing them? What will happen if we refuse to bend like the willow and insist on resisting like the oak? The answer is easy. We will set up a series of inner conflicts. We will be worried, tense, strained, and neurotic. Beautiful little one. <sighs> if we go still further and reject the harsh world of reality and retreat into a dream world of our own making, we will then be insane. During the war, millions of frightened soldiers had either to accept the inevitable or break under the strain. To illustrate, let's take the case of William H. Cassilius. 71, 26, 67th Street, Glendale, New York. Here is a prize-winning talk he gave before one of my adult education classes in New York. Shortly after I joined the Coast Guard, I was assigned to one of the hottest spots on the side of the Atlantic. I was made a supervisor of explosives, 
Imagine it, me, a cracker salesman becoming a supervisor of explosives. The very thought of finding yourself standing on top of thousands of tons of TNT is enough to chill tomorrow in a cracker salesman's bones. I was given only two days of instruction and what I learned filled me with even more terror. I'll never forget my first assignment. On a dark, cold, foggy day, I was given my orders on the open pier of Cabin Point, Bayonne, New Jersey. I was assigned to hold number five on my ship. I had to work down in that hold with five longshoremen. They had strong backs, but they knew nothing, whatever, about explosives. And they were loading blockbusters, each one of which contained a ton of TNT enough explosive to blow that old ship to kingdom come. These blockbusters were being lowered by two cable slings. I kept saying to myself, suppose one of those cables slipped or broke. Oh boy, was I scared. I trembled, my mouth was dry, my knees sagged, my heart pounded, but I couldn't run away. That would be desertion. I would be disgraced, my parents would be disgraced and I might be shot for desertion. Desertion. <laughs> I couldn't run, I had to stay. I kept looking at the careless way those longshoremen were handling those blockbusters. The ship might blow up any minute. After an hour or more of this spine chilling terror, I began to use a little common sense. I gave myself a good talking to. I said, look here. So you're blown up, so what? You will never know the difference. It will be an easy way to die. Much better than dying by cancer. Don't be a fool. You can't expect to live forever. You've got to do this job or be shot. So you might as well like it. I talked to myself like that for hours and I began to feel at ease. Finally, I overcame my worry and fears by forcing myself to accept an inevitable situation. I'll never forget that lesson every time I am tempted now to worry about something I cannot possibly change. I shrug my shoulders and say, forget it. I find that it works, even for a cracker salesman. Hooray, let's give three cheers and one cheer more for the cracker salesman of a pinafore. Outside the crucifixion of Jesus, the most famous death scene in all history is the death of Socrates. 10,000 centuries from now, men will still be reading and cherishing Plato's immortal description of it. One of the most moving and beautiful passages in all literature. Certain men of Athens jealous and envious of old barefooted Socrates, trumped up charges against him and had him tried and condemned to death. When the friendlier jailer gave Socrates the poison cup to drink, the jailer said, try to bear lightly what needs must be. Socrates did. He faced death with a calmness and resignation that touched the hem of divinity. Try to bear lightly what needs must be. Those words were spoken 399 years before Christ was born. But this worrying old world needs those words today more than ever before. Try to bear lightly what needs must be. During the past eight years, I have been reading practically every book and magazine article I could find that dealt even remotely with banishing worry. Would you like to know what is the best single bit of advice about worry that I have ever discovered in all that reading? Well, here it is. It is summed up in 27 words, words that you and I ought to paste on our bathroom mirrors so that each time we wash our faces, we could also wash away all worry from our minds. This priceless prayer was written by Dr. Reinhold Niebuhr Professor of Applied Christianity, Union Theological Seminary, Broadway, at 120th Street, New York. God, grant me the serenity 
to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. To break the worry habit before it breaks you, rule number four is cooperate with the inevitable. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you.